imagine for a moment that by some miracle of technology or of God, you're transported to an alternate history world, an ideal world. The first thing you notice, of course, is the incredible beauty. You find yourself standing in a lush valley with a singing brook wandering down from high mountains framed in a golden sunset. Even the colors of this world seem more vivid. Scattered throughout the valley are farms. The buildings are in an architectural style you don't recognize, but they fit with the landscape perfectly. Behind you, the path you're on, seemingly dirt, but smooth and forgiving under your feet, leads down toward a city, golden in the sunlight, marred by no trace of mist or pollution. Much as the mountains entice, it is the people of this world you want to find. You ramble down the path for a long time and observe the inhabitants. The first thing that strikes you is their seeming joy and peace. Here, for example, is a man driving what can only be a tractor, and he's moving across the road and warmly thanked by his neighbor for the use of the tool. Even the fences are obviously designed only to keep livestock in. There are no locks on gates, no walls around even the largest homes. You sense, with a gift of insight, that there is no coveting or self-serving here. A day later in the city, you realize that all these people are as gracious as that first farmer. They share openly and live peacefully, and over and over you hear them speaking well of each other. This world, you notice, is not without its dangers. By the edge of a deep blue lake, you see a group of children playing. By accident, not by malice, one child knocks another in. They cry and scream and don't know what to do like ordinary children. But when an adult runs up and rescues the endangered one, there's no shame, no lies, no cover-up, only a brief and apparently soon forgiven remorse on the part of the child who did the pushing. And in the, as in the country, the city seems to be a place with no locks. Farmers come in the morning and deliver food to restaurants and stores, but there are no clipboards, no checklists, no review of what is given or what is received. In fact, it often appears that, that morning that the person delivering the supplies simply walks into the store and places what he has brought on the counter with no accountability at all. Theft must be a foreign concept here. Curious, you wander further that day and confirm your suspicion that there are no police here. No stations, no vehicles on patrol, no bobbies on foot in any kind of uniform. You have the sudden conviction that if theft is non-existent, then the larger crimes of assault and rape and murder must be equally rare. These people just don't seem to be in the habit of hurting one another. You feel a little strange about walking into one of the unlocked homes with the family there, but your curiosity has grown strong. You're not surprised to see that two families are there apparently sharing a meal. You are a little surprised to see that the face of one of the two women is disfigured by burn scars. You had forgotten that this world could be dangerous, but you're struck by the love that the woman's husband shows to her and by the sudden realization that he treats his neighbor's beautiful, kindly wife well, but with no trace of lust or flirtation. With the insight that you're becoming accustomed to on this world, you know that he is 100% loyal to his spouse. It's almost a relief to all this cloying niceness when a loud series of shouts breaks out in the backyard. But when you follow the parents out, you find that the shouting is just a case of youthful enthusiasm over some game the kids are playing. When the parents urge the kids to keep it down and think of the well-being of their neighbors, the response is immediate and respectful. You feel that you can see into their souls that this honor for their parents is real and deep. The next day will be your sixth, observing the strange, wonderful, and alien society. In all that time, you've heard no arguments, no raised voices, no curses. Life seems to flow on in an endless and potentially dull routine. Do these people have no highs, no lows? But that morning, things seemed different. The city, 
which has had a certain level of music to it ever since you arrived, now seems suffused with it, and the morning routine of the families you're watching is different. You notice that no one is heading out to, the open, to open the stores, no one coming into town with deliveries. This must be Sunday, or its equivalent. That's confirmed a few moments later when the families come out and get in their vehicles or walk toward the structures that you had tentatively identified as places of worship. Light, white, set on hills or deep in the woods, these seem to be quiet each day, and you hadn't taken much notice of them. But today, every family, every individual, seems headed for one of these buildings. Warm greetings fill the air and an almost irresistible music flows out. Middle-aged men and women are helping their older parents into the large central hall. They joyfully greet others whom they've clearly known all their lives. Everyone you've seen over your days in the city seems to have gathered. From some place, the music swells, and a man steps out. You recognize that this is praise to God. And as the service of celebration goes on, you see deeply into the hearts of those around you and realize that this is the excitement you've been looking for. All these people, every one of them, is filled to overflowing with joy and praise. Not one is missing. The little boy who nearly drowned and the woman with the disfigured face and the old man who could barely raise his fork joined the joyous singing just as fully as the farmers and merchants, teachers and housewives, all singing praise to their God. Well, the start, you realize that your perception has now penetrated even deeper to the core of their existence and at that core, you see a soul, not many souls, but one soul that loves. The love you've seen in the community is only the outworking of the love that soul receives from God and the love it mirrors. And suddenly, all you've seen from the moment you've arrived is transformed in one, into one crystallized picture of a world with God at its center around whom everything revolves and from whom everything flows. And that, my friends, is what the law shows. That's the Ten Commandments, or most of them anyway, taken not as negatives to be avoided, but as positives to be lived. That's my pale, lifeless attempt to picture what it would be like if all people loved the Lord their God with all their heart and soul and mind and strength and their neighbor as themselves. For as Jesus taught, these things sum up the law given to Moses on Sinai and to the people of Israel in the desert, and the law shows what it looks like to live out this central love. It also sadly shows what it looks like to ignore or rebel against that core of love. And every day in this world, in the real world, we see what depths fallen humanity falls to when the law of love is not lived out. So what I tried to do there was also a description of what the Bible calls shalom, the Hebrew word translated peace. But it really means so much more than that. So that in recent years, people have been calling it human flourishing, itself an ancient Greek concept. Cornelius Pontinga Jr. describes biblical shalom as a state in which the physical world, humanity, its cultures and ethnicities, families, married couples, friends and individuals all exist in wholeness while enjoying edifying relations with each other and encouraging one another's virtues. This is what the law shows. It shows first this ideal of loving behavior. And yet the law also vividly reveals the other side, that as fallen and lost people, we cannot keep this idea. Yet when we're rescued from the curse of the law, it again becomes the ideal of human flourishing toward which faith guides us. So when we last left our story, the people of Israel had been rescued from Egypt, from slavery, by the blood of the lamb on the door. 
as they left Pharaoh hardened his heart again and sent his army to pursue them. Trapped against the shore of the Red Sea, they were on the verge of destruction when God rescued them, parting the sea, drowning the Egyptian army. Not long after that, they arrived at Mount Sinai, where God appeared in fire and smoke and cloud and earthquake and gave to Moses the Ten Commandments, even as the people were down in the valley making a golden calf and falling into idolatry. So from the beginning, the Ten Commandments were never lived out. And the same can be said of the whole law of Moses. All the parts which regulate moral behavior and human relationships, the principles of worship, all of these have stated positively instead of negatively, translate into an ideal society. Over and over this summer, we turn to the Pentateuch, to the law, to see what compassion and outreach would look like. We heard about God's heart for the refugee, for the orphan, his provision for the homeless, the destitute, the oppressed. We saw how the smallest details of the law support the vision of human flourishing and how the largest principles of the law, love God and love others, are the foundation of human flourishing. But the law does not just postulate this ideal society. It also reveals very clearly that you cannot live up to this ideal. You and I and the nation of Israel and every culture that has ever laid claim to human lives has failed miserably at keeping the shalom that God made clear at Sinai. It's amazing to me that while Moses was off getting a law which had as its first precept, you shall have no other gods before me, the people were gathering their bits and pieces of gold jewelry and forming them into an idol, an image of a calf to be worshipped in God's place. I mean, the smoke and the fire that they greatly feared were still up there on the mountain, for goodness sake, when they forsook the God who had brought them there. The bodies of Pharaoh's army had barely begun to decompose in the sea. The tears of the Egyptians had barely ceased when God's people shook their fists at God's wonders and ran off after powerless images. It was inevitable. The law pictures a shalom that no one can possess, not because it's too great an ideal, but because fallen human beings can't and won't obey even the first of these commandments to have no other gods before me. Israel couldn't at the foot of Mount Sinai, and no generation has done so. We fail. We worship ourselves. We worship ideologies. We worship men who set them up in the place, themselves up in the place of God. We worship comfort and safety and honor, and a whole host of invisible gods, even when we don't crassly fall down before graven images. John Calvin said that the heart is an idol factory. One of the great moments for me at seminary was when my Hebrew professor, John Salehammer, pointed out that Moses knew this, that God told Moses what would happen under this law of human flourishing. Deuteronomy 31, 16 to 21, and the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. Then this people will rise and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering, and they will forsake me and break my covenant that I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them and hide my face from them, and they will be devoured, and many evils and troubles will come upon them, so that they will say in the day, in that day, have not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil that they have done because they have turned to other gods. Now therefore write this song and teach it to the people of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the people of Israel. For when I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to give to their fathers, and they have eaten and are full and grown fat, they will turn to other gods and serve them and despise me and break my covenant. 
and when many evils and troubles have come upon them, this song shall confront them as a witness, for it will live unforgotten in the mouths of their offspring. For I know that they are inclined to do what they are inclined to do even today, before I have brought them into the land I swore to give them. This isn't the best-known bit of the Old Testament, but it reinforces a key truth that while the law is good, no one keeps it. Moses, you're not going to be cold in the grave before those people will rise and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they're entering. And they'll forsake me and break my covenant. Verse 18, they've turned to other gods. Verse 20, for I know what they're inclined to do even today before I bring them into the land. God's people do not, indeed cannot, keep God's law. And the rest of Scripture confirms this. The, the prophets accurately accuse Israel and Judah of idolatry that displaces God in their hearts and of injustice that displaces love for others. Jesus accuses the Pharisees and religious leaders in his day, though their idolatry wasn't a worship of false gods, but a worship of tradition above God. And Paul makes it clear that none is righteous and that no one keeps the law. He, he says those who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. Think about it. Even if we reduce the law to loving God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength and loving our neighbors as ourselves, we all fail miserably. It's not that we don't love God sometimes. Sometimes people do. But often we don't. Our hearts are distracted to find security in other things that become our idols. It's not that we don't love others sometimes. We do. But then there are those times when we say what we know shouldn't be said and do what we know shouldn't be done so that we hate and we hurt. And so the law, in the words we heard in that uh, first song, the law is all the law I cannot keep. So my first point this morning was that the law does provide a beautiful ideal for human flourishing. But at the same time, the law shows us that we can't keep it. And so none of us is righteous. We're all under sin and desperately in need of rescue. The last point is going to be that for those rescued, the law once again provides an ideal of human thriving. But before we go there, we need to get rescued, don't we? And that comes through Jesus Christ. I didn't have time to go into it, but that Deuteronomy passage points forward to the fact that God will always be faithful. And so now in Jesus Christ, God has proven himself faithful. Jesus Christ was himself sinless. Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. And in offering himself as a sacrifice, he paid the price of our sin and lawlessness, the penalty of our law breaking. So Paul says that a righteousness not by the works of the law, but by faith has now come. Verse Romans 3.21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. He says elsewhere, for it's by grace that you are saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. It's not a result of works so that no one may boast. We're rescued, forgiven of our sins, and made new, made righteous in the sight of God by trusting the work of Jesus. And don't get the idea that God ever had a double standard. This faith by which we're saved is not an afterthought. It is his intention all along, as we saw in Genesis 15 a few weeks ago. One of God's purposes in the Exodus was to get his people to trust him so that he would take care of them and bring them to the promised land. Exodus 14, 31 says, And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did against the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. They trusted him for that moment. And so when God gives the law, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of bondage, right? You shall have no other gods before me. He said, remember, I, I just showed my love to you, my power on your behalf. So, so trust me. 
trust me now and look for no other help. So the Ten Commandments then are based on the faith that the people were supposed to have in the God of the Exodus, just as the moral teachings of the New Testament are based on faith in the Lord of Good Friday and Easter. This is what Paul believed, that faith led to changed lives that began to reveal the shalom envisioned by the law. We were just in Ephesians 2, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Amen to that. But, in the next verse, Paul says, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. What are those good works? They are not works of righteousness by which we hope to be saved. They're the fruit of our rescue that manifests itself in behaviors that we call good and which, in fact, on every level, mirror the law and what the law was intended to show. As John Piper puts it, the law of Moses simply spells out the way Israelites will live if they generally feel their future is secure in God. You don't steal if your future is secure in God. You can't abuse others for self-gain by killing or lying or seducing another spouse or dishonoring your parents if you really believe that the God of the Exodus and the God at Easter is that God of Easter is at work to give you the future that is best for you. We obey the Old Testament commands the same way we obey the New Testament, not to win God's favor, but because we already depend on his free grace. We trust that his commands will lead to full and lasting joy. And it is true that since Jesus has come, he's fulfilled the sacrificial side of the law. He's declared all foods to be clean. He's founded a new people of God that is not nationally organized. And so a lot of the law doesn't apply to us. Dietary laws, laws about sacrifices, laws about political organization and national behavior. But vast portions of the Pentateuch describe dimensions of shalom which are true for God's people in every age, including our own. Romans 8 teaches us that the law itself cannot produce this kind of behavior, and so God has given us his Holy Spirit in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You and I, as vessels for God's Holy Spirit, can begin to fulfill the law in the power of the Spirit through faith and revealing itself in love. So returning to the Ten Commandments, we find that the New, Test the New Testament believers are called to the same vision of human flourishing. At the, at the essential level, Jesus and Paul teach us to love God with all our hearts and to love our neighbors, and they claim that this fulfills God's law. But when we look closer, we find both positive and sometimes negative commands in the New Testament that call us to the exact same shalom revealed in the Ten Commandments. And yes, we still need negative commandments. For our sinful nature, our flesh is still at war within us. But we also need and receive these glorious positive exhortations that mirroring the Ten Commandments because the Holy Spirit is at work in us as we've trusted God. So the, whole, so the New Testament exhorts us to follow God alone. One of the places Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is human flourishing. It's the positive command to make God first in everything. Again, Paul often warns against idolatry in all its forms. Colossians 3, 5, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is or which are idolatry. In Galatians 5, he lists idolatry as one of the works of the flesh, the sinful nature in contrast to the fruit of walking with the Holy Spirit by faith. 
And in Colossians, again, he says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Do you see that? That's a vision of human flourishing that has no room for idolatry because our hearts and minds and lives are set on the things above. And in that vision, there is also no room for speaking evil of God, taking his name in vain. The book of Hebrews says that through Jesus then, let us then continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. James tells us the same mouth should not curse and bless. Even the Sabbath, not legalistically, but as part of the vision of human flourishing, is found in the New Testament. The book of Hebrews teaches clearly that there remains a, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. <laughs> All right? It's not just today. This is rest and Jesus who comforts and refreshes us. And the practice of the New Testament church has also included gathering once a week for worship and for fellowship. Then there are the love your neighbor commandments. Honor your father and mother. And Paul emphasizes the flourishing that's already in the command, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. You shall not murder. Jesus elevates anger to the level of murder. But then he says, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. The, the positive alternative to murder. You shall not commit adultery. Again, Jesus makes it a hard issue. The lust in your hearts, the locker room banter on the bus, it is idolatry. But the book of Hebrews puts it positively. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. A positive vision. You shall not steal. Paul puts it positively. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Do you see that? The law turned on its head, lived out in its positive implications by faith, becomes a vision of human shalom, human flourishing. That which we cannot keep by works becomes the ideal for our community life together in faith. That's what the law is supposed to be all about. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Colossians 3, 9, do not lie to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Paul later says, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. We're going to put on this new self and speak to each other with grace and love, and the community of people doing that will flourish. We will flourish. We will experience shalom. Tenth commandment, you shall not covet. And Paul spends a lot of time on this in Romans 7 as an example of how the law shows our sin, and it does. But the positive side of this is beautiful. 2 Corinthians 8, 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. Generosity, not coveting is at the heart of human flourishing. So do you see this? I, I, I find this just an incredible concept. The law built by negatives and positives is actually a vision of shalom. It's God's desire for his people from the garden to eternity. And yes, idolatrous and selfish human beings like you and me cannot keep the law. Our hearts are idol factories we seek security in everything except God. We love ourselves and not our neighbors. But it is by faith in God, faith in Jesus, and through the gift of the Holy Spirit that we can begin again to live out this shalom. And this is what the New Testament calls us to, 
to transformed lives through the renewing of our minds so that we begin to demonstrate true worship, true love for God, true love for our neighbor, and that we begin in some small way to give the world an image of human flourishing.